Hey cats, it's Ed Midsole Bud here. Today I'm going to take a look at some of the shoes with a little bit more baggage. The models have caused a stir, the biggest running shoe controversies ever. Thanks for tuning in people, hit that subscribe button and also give this video a thumbs up like. Comment below as well to help out with the algorithm. Danke schön. The first controversy, I'm going to start back in 1978. A vintage year for running shoes, Nike released the Tailwind, complete with a full length air sole unit. I think it was pretty much full length, this almost all the way to the end there. That was quite the tech back in the day. Nike were really proud of that stuff and they were trying to get it into as many new shoes as possible. Don't forget that Nike were quite a small company back then as well, not the behemoth that they are now. They were just trying to get their foot in the door in terms of athletics tech. No pun intended. I really do think that air technology as well helped them to get to where they are today. More of a lifestyle brand, I suppose. It's basically the same air and foam design as we have in the Alpha Fly, but I'll get to that in a bit. This shoe was released in 1978, albeit at a reduced stock level at the Honolulu Marathon. Then it got a much larger release in 1979. Nike did even have to advise people that these shoes might feel a bit strange on foot to begin with. They had to reassure runners that that sort of sinking feeling in the heel was actually okay. There was a little bit of time for adaption that you would need to get the best out of the shoes. It's pretty much exactly what they say now about the Vaporfly and the Alpha Fly. Also, they did tell people that they should never put these into the washing machine, but that goes without saying, right? The Tailwind at the time was one of the most expensive running shoes out there, though it did come with some quality issues, so nothing's changed really between then and 2024. Apparently, the silver paint on the shoes would flake away and shed from the upper, it forced Nike into a mass recall of the original run of the shoes. Within Phil Knight's memoir, he mentions how the shoes caused quite a stir. I mean, that's been something that Nike had been doing ever since, isn't it? After 10 days of the launch, it was found that small fragments within the metal paint used on the shoes caused the upper sections to rub and just literally fall to pieces. After loads of refunds and returns, they realized that perhaps introducing so many new innovations into one shoe at once was probably not the best idea. Moving on to innovations now to the Alpha Fly. We all know that shoe. It's the one that Kipchoge used to break the two hour barrier in that Ineos challenge. Remember, it wasn't a race, it was a challenge. The distance completed with a pacer car with a laser, a revolving bunch of pacers to run with him in an arrowhead formation, along with specifically chosen course and optimum weather conditions tree lined area there lots and lots of oxygen and lots of supporters don't forget so the shoes gotta be the shoes right 40 mil of stack here dual airpods in the forefoot and multiple carbon plates as well maybe they were even four airpods there's a bit of a conspiracy about that there was a patent that nike put out that did show a very different version of the alpha fly perhaps to the one that we got on general release later on did the one he used feature multiple plates and more airpods AirPods than we got. The AirPods in this older one I've got here definitely don't seem quite as pressurized as they were before. I got some real close-up photos here that were actually taken by my good buddy Kev Next Percent Burton. Pretty sure that Kipchoge is wearing the same ones here that we got later on. But of course people pour over that sort of patent design. Look at the images kind of wishing perhaps that it was a slightly different shoe. Perhaps it had additional tech and components there to make up his pair. I guess we may never know. So basically the Alpha Fly caused World Athletics to come up with a new set of rules that all new race shoes would have to adhere to if they were going to be allowed in championship racing. The sole must be no thicker than 40 millimeters in the sample size. You're only allowed to have one rigid plate within the shoe. You're not allowed to stack them or have them overlapping or anything like that either. So they tried to put some barriers onto the shoes, but of course that didn't stop people, did it? When you got the Alpha Fly, it looked like it was going to be the biggest one ever. Adidas came to spoil the party. Bigger midsole and bigger controversy. So in 2021, Adidas released the Adi Zero Prime X. That's a 50 millimeter heel stack shoe in the sample size. It was kind of met with bemusement really by a lot of runners. Is it like a race shoe? Is it a training shoe? Can you even run in it if it's got 50 mil of heel stack? Well, the answer is yes, you can run in it. And I think for most people, the answer was 
It's a training shoe, really, like a long-distance one. Yes, it's illegal for elite championship runners to wear, but for absolutely average folk like us, yeah, it's absolutely fine. As long as you're running on nice straight roads with no debris and sharp turns and stuff, yeah good to go. I gotta be honest, I just found it quite a stable shoe really. This is the Strung version, so slightly different upper, but the midsole is exactly the same as that original. I found it to be fantastic on long runs in training. That massive midsole helps to reduce the fatigue and strain on the legs. And it's one of the most durable shoes ever. I think it's about 150 miles on this and it's pretty much perfect really. Just got better and better. The midsole foam actually got a little bit more squashy and forgiving over time. Just creates a bit of an effortless feel really. Maybe the heel stability for some people won't be quite on point and it's a very narrow heel back here as well quite different in fact to the alpha fly where you got a lot more heel width the prime x really is sort of like for faster paced longer runs i found the shoe really reduced my heart rate down as well i could run at sort of 730 per mile pace and it was almost like easy i suppose i think if you were using it for marathon training to like absorb the impact of those miles it was ideal but of course there was one runner who thought that you know he'd try his luck maybe and wear it in a race see if he can get away with wearing it in a marathon i mean who's gonna notice right back in september 2021 darara harissa used the prime x rather than the adios pro 2 and won the vienna city marathon in 2 hours, 9 minutes, 22 seconds. I mean, it's not quite an insane record-breaking time or anything. I think it was only about 3 seconds faster than the guy in second place. But he still won the event nonetheless, and then was promptly disqualified. It was found that he was wearing the wrong shoes. Sounds like something out of a Wallace and Gromit episode. Apparently the kit that he'd had checked the day before, that featured the Adios Pro 2. That's the race legal version of the Adi Zero series, but on the day he rocked up wearing the Prime X and by all accounts and what he says it was a bit of a honest mistake. He said that his preparation for the Vienna City Marathon was really good and he switched shoes for the first time, put these on, he didn't really notice that they were any different. He said that the colours were very similar. So I guess, yeah, it could be an honest mistake. He suddenly realised maybe near the end or afterwards, perhaps he thought, oh, this is nice and easy today. You know, it's just like a long run with the guys. But as soon as he finished, someone came over and informed him that he had in fact been disqualified. I guess the Pro 2 and the Primax Originals look close enough, I suppose, in the upper. Very similar materials there. But surely he would have detected some difference underfoot. I know I certainly would going down the stairs in these you've got to be a bit careful adidas have always been keen to mention that this is very much like a concept running shoe they're sort of like training purposes a model designed without limitations to push the boundaries of the current running technology available and they created it consciously being outside of the world athletics guidelines so they're being very very forthright with that obviously the primex led us to have lots of other sort of illegally stacked shoes like the Kinvara Pro here, not quite the same underfoot feel. And of course, the slightly more popular Super Blast as well from Asics. That one really is a winner, just keeps on going. I mean, when you look at some of the stuff we got today, we really have come a long way from the air sole unit that we had in the Tailwind. Although, looking at the back of the shoe here, there's that really aggressive bevel that we're seeing on quite a few shoes nowadays. So it seems like we've made a few steps forward and a few steps backwards, perhaps. So that's three of the biggest running shoe controversies we've had over the last few years. Let me know your thoughts and opinions on these down in the comments. Very quick musical interlude for you. Today from Rob Bass and DJ Easy Rock, It Takes Two. What a great track. I remember having a cassette tape with this one on. I listened to it over and over again. I think I even made a copy of it. I was so worried that the tape might snap. I loved this track because it featured several different breakbeat layers on top of each other. Really created this awesome sort of bouncing kind of feel. I guess we saw some of that in sort of later hip hop in the 90s. But Rob Bass and DJ Easy Rock were there way before that. Really cool little interspersed parts that they'd sampled from other tracks as well, just to provide a little bit more kind of interest to the beat. And 
I think probably one of the most memorable choruses as well. It takes two, you know, everybody knows that track. I guess if you're talking about number-based hip-hop tracks, It Takes Two is there along with De La Soul and their Three Feet High and Rising and Three is the Magic Number. Such cool use of the little bass line sample as well in the track. It just all comes together to make a very memorable kind of high-energy hip-hop tune for the time. Rob Bass and DJ Easy Rock with It Takes Two. Thanks for tuning in, people. It's always appreciated. Hit that subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up like. Also, comment below. It really helps out. My name's Ed Bird and I'll be seeing you.